uh, you're joining me today. Uh, we're uh, thrilled that to have this chance to chat with you and that you'll be coming to the seminar. Now, not everyone in my tribe is familiar with naturopaths, so I thought we could start sure. getting a little better understanding of what your training is like. Sure. So a naturopathic physician, you know, our, our training isn't dissimilar from what you went through as a medical doctor or what osteopathic doctors go through in their training. You know, the first, you know, two years of our medical education is, is identical. You know, we go through gross anatomy, biochemistry, physiology. I think the biggest difference is when we get into our second, you know, two years of school, our third and fourth year, you as medical doctors, you go into hospitals, you do clerkships where you learn OBGYN and pediatrics and surgery and so forth. You know, we are really outpatient based uh, clinicians so we go to outpatient clinic, cl uh, clinics we do family medicine and you know really fundamentally I think the biggest difference is really philosophical you know naturopathic physicians come from a philosophy of you know treating the whole person using you know therapies with the least force least side effects mm -hmm. so you know, we have six tenants of naturopathic medicine that I think a lot of doctors incorporate as part of their practice as well but you know it's always looking at you know really is what is the root cause of illness you know we're not as interested in giving you a therapy that's just going to put a band-aid on the situation we really want to get to the root of what's causing these underlying illnesses correct it permanently so that people really restore their health so at the end of the day really what we have is a philosophical difference and again it's not that naturopaths are against using drugs or surgery it's just that there's a hierarchy and we'd like to use the safest least invasive therapies first and that's why we talk a lot about diet we talk a lot about nutrition you know really these foundational things of health and that if we need to you know use higher interventions of something like you know botanical medicine drug surgery we certainly can do that but again we like to start with this foundational stuff first and, and for uh, again uh, uh, my tribe this is why for many people the naturopathic physicians were at the uh, forefront of the functional medicine movement because they have right. this much longer history of delving into the root cause uh, in really starting with diet and lifestyle. Uh, and so um, I, I'm pleased to say, Darren, I, I've gotten uh, much more excited, enthusiastic about the naturopathic approach uh, to optimizing health and managing many uh, chronic diseases. Now, well, you know, I got to say, Terry, you know, when I read your book, it's funny because if you didn't put MD after your name, you would think that a naturopath had written that book. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. philosophically, you know, we are very aligned in what we are trying to accomplish. But again, it's just that understanding that real healing doesn't come from a drug and it rarely comes from surgery. You know, that is to take care of the problem uh, at hand, but to really, again, have this foundational change, that's going to come from lifestyle management, that's going to come from diet changes, and you outline it, you know, beautifully in your book. Yeah, you know, this really is all about helping our cells uh, conduct the chemistry of life more correctly. Uh, yeah. And yes, there may be times that there's so much damage that has occurred, we are going to have to use prescription medication. And right. there may even be times I tell people that, uh, yes, it would be appropriate for them to use drug-based modifying uh, uh, treatments for right. their autoimmune disease. So it's not that uh, I'm opposed to it uniformly, and I'm sure it's not that you're opposed to it uniformly. Um, Absolutely. But everyone, everyone uh, with an autoimmune disease should be using diet and lifestyle first. And then we make a clinical decision, uh, do we need to go further with uh, drug-based therapies? Uh, yeah. Now, uh, Darren, uh, you have a autoimmune practice. Can you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So my practice, I'm really, I'm an environmental medicine doctor by training. I've trained with the American Academy of Environmental Medicine that really looks at all these different environmental factors that influence health. So that's, you know, that is diet. That is, you know, chemical exposure. It's things like mold. You know, all these different things we get exposed to can have a negative impact on our bodies and certainly our immune system. And when we're dealing with autoimmune disease, you know, we want to make sure that we're really getting good control over, you know, that part of the immune system. So so it's, you know, my practice is really centered around, you know, how do we help identify, you know, what these underlying factors are, what are these triggers for people, and then, you know, we've got a lot of therapies at our disposal that can help modulate the immune system in a way, you know, even beyond diet and, you know, therapeutic lifestyle, you know, we can actually manipulate the immune system in a positive way to basically help make the immune system stronger and, and healthier. Um, now, many of our um, tribe, if they hear, hear the word, a stronger immune system, 
they're going to freak out like, oh, my God, I don't want my immune system stronger because my immune system is attacking my brain, my joints, my lungs, my skin. And yet here you are, Dr. Ingalls, tell me I need a stronger immune system. Uh, why don't you explain uh, sure. what we mean? Because many of my folks are now just getting uh, very frightened. Yeah, I really should qualify, you know, stronger doesn't mean that you're making a stronger immune response. Stronger means that, I should say, healthier. And what that really means is about immune modulation. You know, if you think of your immune system very simply, there's sort of the two parts. There's the one part that directly goes after whatever it sees as being foreign and starts to attack it. And then there's that other part, which is really more antibody driven. That's what drives allergy. That's what drives autoimmunity. So for people with autoimmune disease, it's that part of your immune system that's really dysfunctional. And a lot of people I see who have autoimmune disease, they don't necessarily get sick more often than people who don't have an autoimmune disease. That part of the immune system actually seems to work quite well, but it's this other part that's really dysfunctional. So when I say make it stronger, what I really mean is that we're trying to modulate the immune system and essentially turn off that overexpression of the immune system so that the healthy parts working well, that you can still fight any bacteria or virus that comes along, but that overexpression of really what we you know call the Th2 pathway or T helper cell 2 pathway, that's what drives a lot of that autoimmune antibody response. And that's why people often, in addition to having autoimmune disease, they have more allergies and other types of dispositions towards things like, you know, mold and food sensitivities and so forth. So ultimately, we're trying to really reel in that part of the immune system. Again, for everyone who's listening here, what, what Darren and I do is we uh, create a lot more balance uh, uh, in the immune uh, system uh, cascades. Uh, and so you may have heard of helper cells, uh, T regulatory cells. Uh, we're trying to get a balance between those uh, cells. If we have imbalance, we end up with more autoimmunity. We can end up with more infection, uh, or we could end up with um, uh, more cancers. So, so we have to have everything uh, fully uh, balanced or appropriately modulated. Uh, exactly. So diet, diet lifestyle are, are key. Uh, Darren is uh, certainly a very expert in additional uh, modalities, uh, 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 very wise in terms of herbal remedies, I'm sure, uh, with your naturopathic background. Yeah, so we use a lot of botanical medicine, and actually we use a lot of, you know, specific types of immune therapy. You know, immunotherapy is a very broad category. I mean, they use immune therapy in cancer care, and but we use it more as a way to help, again, turn off or balance that immune system, whether it's to a food, if it's to mold, if it's to pollen, if it's to a chemical. So whatever we can help identify that's triggering your immune system. And when I was at your conference this past July, you know, what I shared with the group is really how different infectious agents can be immune triggers as well. And we just have, you know, a ton of data in the medical literature how different viruses and bacteria actually activate the immune system in a negative way. So if there's a way that we can help, again, kind of reel that in, it makes a huge difference in how people feel. So again, we have a very specific kind of therapy called low-dose immunotherapy that's really designed to target microbes. So if it's, you know, Lyme disease, if it's Epstein-Barr, if it's, you know, with a strep, you know, strep, there's a yeah. way, yeah, you know, there is a way that we can help start again to turn off that reaction to that very specific organism. So, you know, part of our work up when we're working with our patients is again to help identify what that exposure has been. And then if we know that they've had the exposure and they're having the symptoms, you know, this is a therapy that we can use to try and help turn that off. Turn that off. And now, uh, when you were with us uh, last time, uh, uh, people really uh, appreciated the conversation about uh, Lyme's disease uh, yeah. because there is a tremendous amount of, uh, or number of people who have an autoimmune disease right. um, and also have evidence of Lyme exposure. Uh, yeah. And that is part of their illness. Um, so uh, I know uh, you, for a long time, practiced out there in Connecticut. Yeah, I was in Connecticut for uh, almost 20 years. And of course, for people who don't know, Lyme disease is named after Lyme, Connecticut. It's a city that was about 30 minutes from where I live. That's where they first identified this cluster of children back in the late 70s that were having what they thought was juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and found many years later it was actually caused by this bacteria, uh, which we call Borrelia, mostly Borrelia burgdorferi. And uh, since then, we've now learned that there's many other strains of this bacteria that can cause Lyme disease. But, you know, Lyme disease, you know, for me, you know, again, I had classic Lyme disease. I was treated fairly early. 
but you know, months later I started relapsing and had symptoms. You know, it took me two years to really feel like I got my health back and then did really quite well for many, many, many years and then went through some life stress and a few years after that developed, you know, MS. So, you know, in my opinion, I think, you know, the Lyme set the stage for MS for me. And again, we've yeah. got some evidence that, you know, Lyme can attack certain proteins in the brain that break down myelin. So again, it's not everybody, but for some people out there, you know, when I see patients specifically that have an MS diagnosis, it's always one of the first things I look at because again, there is that correlation with some folks with Lyme being a trigger for MS. And then when we start dealing with Lyme disease, a lot of these MS symptoms do improve. It, and I uh, want to reassure my tribe, you're in good shape. You uh, are doing well. You obviously look very well. And when you were back at our uh, event last year, you looked fabulous and had a great presentation. People uh, liked a whole lot. So you want to reassure our tribe you're in good shape there, Darren? I'm, I'm doing Perfectly great. And I got to say, you know, having been at your conference was so inspiring, even for me, as much as I know and what I do, you know, being surrounded by other people who've really implemented everything that you talk about, uh, really lit a fire under my rear end. And uh, since then, I've been totally, you know, level two, level three on the walls diet. All right feel great. And actually, uh, my, my fiance, who uh, is my salad creator, uh, yes. has put together some beautiful uh, salads. And we're incorporating just again a lot of colors, a lot of different vegetables. And I feel great. Uh, it's you, you just feel the difference when you're really eating good, clean, organic food. And I mean, I've always eaten pretty clean anyway, but this was just you know, one level up from what I was doing. And it just made such a huge difference. So I'm, I'm grateful for sharing what you've uh, experienced. Well. It's, it's, Help me personally too. And Darren, I'm, I'm so glad you wanted to come back again uh, uh, this next summer. So uh, we're going to have you talk about mold. Um, so yeah. why don't you give us a, a, the tribe a little sense of why, we, why mold is an issue for some folks uh, and what some of those symptoms might be. Sure. Well, when we talk about mold, we really kind of talk about mold in two parts. You know, mold, you can be allergic to mold spores. And pretty much no matter where you live in the country, there's mold. Uh, certainly where you're at in Iowa, there's a lot. Any places that get humidity or moisture, it's going to potentially have a higher mold count. So being allergic to mold spores, that's an immune reaction to mold. But beyond that, certain mold species, particularly if you've ever been in a water-damaged building, so if you've ever had a leak in your roof, a leak in your basement, a leaky pipe, you know, that stagnant water can actually breed things called mycotoxins. And so certain species of mold will make these mycotoxins. And then when you breathe them in, the mycotoxins themselves, think of them almost like chemicals. They can actually be damaging to your brain, damaging to your lungs. There was a very famous case many years ago with Ed McMahon, who used to be Johnny Carson's sidekick. He and his wife both got deathly ill and actually almost died from having mold in their home from a botched plumbing job. So, you know, mold, water damage can be really serious business for people. And I see a lot of people who have water damage in their home, but they don't know that they have it and that ongoing exposure over time starts causing all these neurological effects so people can get balance issues headaches dizziness nausea vomiting coordination problems sleep disturbances fatigue i mean gosh i know don't know a lot of those symptoms sound like ms and other autoimmune conditions so you know it's just one of those things that you know we have to check off the list as a possibility and again for people who know that yeah you know i had a leak and uh, maybe i took care of it maybe i didn't i find a lot of contractors aren't very skilled at knowing how to properly take care of a water damage leak so, you know, we're going to talk about, about, you know, how people can identify if there might be water damage in their home. Fortunately, there's a lot of testing that's available that can identify your, your exposure in your home. But we can also test you and see what your exposure has been. Uh, and I've had, you know, patients where there's, some of it comes from home, some of it comes from their workplace, some of it comes from their church. So we can measure what your body burden looks like. And if we know that it's high, we've got strategies that we can help, you know, start to mobilize them, get them out of your tissue, better for your body, better for your brain. So we'll talk about some of those different strategies and how to uh, help improve your own health if you've had mold exposure. Um, definitely very worthwhile. Uh, and um, a little sidebar, you, you're probably on top of this. I, I know many of the tribe are not aware of this, uh, mold toxins are uh, part of the uh, biochemical warfare uh, agents uh, that have been developed by a variety of militaries uh, around the world. Uh, yeah. And so uh, we have known medically for decades uh, about the uh, seriousness uh, of mold uh, 
uh, toxins as a biohazard and unfortunately also as an agent of war. So right. I think uh, uh, it's very, very sobering. Yeah, well, again, I think, you know, again, as we go through our checklist of, you know, environmental exposures, uh, this is one of the biggest things that I see with people that uh, can really have a tremendous impact on their health. And you know, when you've got MS or other type of autoimmune disease, because a lot of the symptoms are pretty vague, uh, this can help elucidate whether there's, you know, something else that's contributing to it. Because sometimes we hang our hat that, oh, yeah, this is just part of the condition. And then we find out, oh, no, well, you've got Lyme disease and you've got mycotoxin exposure and you've got all these other things. As we start taking care of each one of those pieces, you know, we find that people's health gets better, better, better. So often there are other explanations of why people feel the way they feel. And again, it's just a process of, you know, being able to identify what those triggers are. Um, it, and the other uh, thing, I, again, I want to point out to the tribe is cognitive decline, uh, yes. brain fog, uh, more anxiety, more depression. All of these mental health issues Absolutely. may also be a reflection of mold. Uh, and so that's another uh, reason to think about these things. Absolutely. Yeah, bet. Now, uh, finally, um, any comments about uh, the uh, uh, folks that came to the seminar, what kind of transformations that you, you were hearing from people who had attended? Yeah, I mean, you know, people, uh, well, of course, everyone I talked to, of course, they were just so excited to have this information. And I think what's really cool about a lot of what you talk about in the seminar is like, look, you know, this is something you have complete control over. This is not you dependent on another doctor. This is not you having to go out spending a ton of money. You know, a lot of these things you talk about are things that anybody can implement at any stage of their life. So no matter where you are in your process, no matter what your state of health is, you know, this is something you can change tomorrow. And granted, you know, we understand that making diet and lifestyle changes because there's a lot of other issues, you know, emotional and otherwise around that. It's not easy, but, you know, you have a choice and you have control. So, you know, for me, again, it was making that choice that, you know, I want to eat healthier than I currently do. And I did it and I feel great for it. Anybody can do that. There's nothing special about that. that. So it was so cool just to hear people. It's like having that sort of awakening moment of like, wow, I actually have a lot of control. I don't have to keep waiting for my neurologist to tell me it's okay. I don't have to wait for a prescription. It's like, I can go tomorrow to a health food store. I can choose to buy, you know, vegetables. I can increase my intake of greens and it's not going to break your piggy bank. So, you know, people were really excited to have that, that plan, that information, you know, it's just empowering when you start putting people's healthcare back in their own hands and sometimes out of the doctor, it's like, look, we have our place. We'd be out of business if we didn't. <laughs> but, yes, yes. You know, we, it, it, we can give that control back to the patient, and they're going to drive a lot of their own health. And to reassure them, it doesn't have to be an either or. You, right. you don't have to decide, like, I'm going to do the Wallace Protocol or I'm going to do conventional drugs. Yeah. Everyone should be doing diet and lifestyle. And, of course, I think it should, of course, should be the Wallace Protocol. But we yeah. all want to address diet and lifestyle and then you can make a separate clinical decision about what's appropriate for you given your situation in terms of the right. drugs well and as i was talking to people who had been repeat uh, attendees you know who'd already kind of been on the program for a while you know some of these people i talked to their health had improved so much they were either off their medication they'd reduced the amount of medication mm -hmm. so their quality of life with or without medication was still better so who doesn't want that who doesn't want a better quality of life and so yeah. again, you're right this is not an either or and even in our world if we're using you know herbs or homeopathics or whatever even natural therapy you know it can all be done in conjunction with diet and lifestyle but again as a naturopathic doctor i mean this is our 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 core thing is that you know, you've got to start with that foundational stuff and so no matter what your health status is what else you're doing in your therapy you can still make these diet and lifestyle changes and it's certainly not going to have a negative impact on your health it can only improve it absolutely well uh darren i am so glad uh that we met and that you came last year and even more glad that you're coming back again this year uh and i look forward to having you there um we're going to be singing and dancing uh, once again uh so i look forward to doing some singing and dancing with you once again it'll be fun it'll be great we'll have a great time Thank you.